Welcome to What is the Meaning with Momi. In this podcast, we talk about meaning, what is meaning, how do we create meaning, and ultimately, really, uh, how do we live a more meaningful life. My name is Chong Shi. I'm here with Ian Nelson, my co-host, and today we've got a very special guest, a really good friend of mine, Dan Kosh. Um, yeah, we met through, out of all things, through Cacao. And then we realized um, we loved the same music. We literally had the same playlist and we were also into DJing. And then um, we also connected on our, our missions, which is to raise the collective consciousness of the world. Um, and so Dan's journey um, kind of took him from a life of a professional DJ and then to going within, finding his himself, his purpose, and now building the leading drinking cacao brand in Australia called Sacred Taste. Um, yeah, can't wait for him to share his story today. Welcome, Dan. Cheers, brother. Thanks for having us on. Can't wait to share the story too, man. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm so hyped for today's conversation. <laughs> you know, we've had, we've had countless conversations, but never in this format. So keen to yeah. see where it goes. Me too. Man, let, let's start with uh, the beginning. You know, um, I, I, I've heard you tell the story many times, but what I would really actually love to know is when you started your music journey as a DJ, um, did you ever think about the why, like why you were doing it? Like, was it just, oh, I love music, let's do this? Or was it, oh, I think I could actually have a career in this and raise my family and and, and this is the life I want to choose. Mm. Interesting question. No one's actually ever asked me that before. So let me ponder that one for a second. Like, what was my why? <laughs> so I guess like, from... <laughs> good question, man. So I guess from a young age, you know, um, I was always into music, loved music. I was introduced to the decks at the age of 14. I was never really into sports, although I was good at whatever I applied my mind to. But for me, sports, I didn't really get into it. I prefer, I preferred music and I preferred expressing myself through music. I think music is the pure form of energy and emotion. And, you know, by changing the music, we can actually change the vibration and mood of yourself and of other people and things like that. And um, yeah, I started playing music when I was 14 playing hip hop, R and B, and I was highly skilled. Like I was way more skilled when I was a kid than even when I was a professional, right? <laughs> way more skilled, just more passion, no business. Just like, it was just passion and pure talent. It was beautiful. And then I got introduced into house music and, you know, and then like me and all my friends, we would go out, we would party and people would know, like see how I could play. And all my friends would basically be like, man, you know, you're better than this guy up on the stage. Like you're better than him. You should be up there. You should be up there. And, you know, I, I did, I did also know that and believe that as well. I was like, I am actually better than this DJ. I'd be able to pick out all their mistakes and their faults. I'm like, oh, wrong track, this, that, you know? And, um, but something was always holding me back and, you know, it wasn't, and really it was until only until I was about 25 that I actually went for it and decided to really pursue it like 100%. And the only reason why that happened was, is because I really should have broken into the scene at like 21. That's when most young DJs break into the scene. But at 25, I still hadn't broken into the scene. And I start to figure out like, why haven't I? Like, why haven't I broken into the scene? And that's when I actually went to a Tony Robbins seminar. And I realized that there's two driving forces. People either move towards pleasure or move away from pain. And what I had this big dream as being a DJ, but there was this little pain barrier that was like, well, what if I get rejected? What if I play music? And as you would know, Chong, being a DJ, there is nothing more heartbreaking than playing an amazing set and you're building the crowd up because I play trance music, which is all about taking people on a journey. Nothing more heartbreaking then building up a set and then playing the wrong track and then the whole dance floor just empties. And so I was like, oh, I don't know if I could deal with that kind of rejection. And so I was very fearful of that rejection. But then when I went to the Tony Robbins seminar, you know, pain, pleasure, I actually thought to myself, well, I had over time, I had this 
bit of like regret start to build up. I haven't made it yet. I haven't made it yet. I'm getting older. Oh my gosh, my time is ticking. And I went to Tony Robbins. And then basically I realized that the, the, the pain of regret of never doing it was actually much greater than my, my fear of actually, you know, being rejected. And what actually twisted it around for me was like, okay, cool. I'm afraid to do this and give it a shot. I know I'm good. I know I'm like, you know, in my circle was one of the best, but I'm like, okay, I've got to get over this fear of rejection. And so what I did was I actually projected myself all the way to the end of years of my life. And I thought, well, what if I gave it a shot and it didn't work out? You know what I mean? I learned a lesson. Cool. I'll deal with the rejection. But what if I went to the end of my life and I never gave it a go? And for me, the pain of like living my life and not listening to my inner child who really wanted to play because it was a childhood dream. For me, the, the, the pain of, of regret of never doing it was, was far too greater. And so that basically, first of all, catapulted me into the scene. I never saw it as like being a lifelong career for me, but I just saw it as my first challenge as a young adult to see if I can actually go for what I want. But I really liked what you said about, was I intending to, you know, use it to support my family, this, that, not really, not directly, because I wasn't thinking about family and stuff like that at the time. But at the time I had a younger brother, he was six years younger than me and myself, I never had any role models. And so that's why I endorsed Tony Robbins and other books to help me get through it. And one of the main motivating factors for me achieving DJing was not just to prove to myself that I can do whatever I want, like I can achieve my dreams, but it was actually to show my little brother that you can go for whatever you want in life. And if you take, if you take your chance, like you can make it. And it's so funny when I broke into the scene, my younger brother came with me and he, re he really wanted to be a photographer. So I bought him a camera and I said, bro, come with me and take photos and I'll use it as my marketing. And so hey, he came with me from gig one to every single gig until I made it. And then when I made it, it was the last gig I ever did. And he wasn't there. Why? Because he actually left and went to London to chase his dream of being a fashion photographer. And I mm. remember it was my last gig. It was Stereo Sonic. And I had a USB with his like logo on it. And I put my music on that, plugged it in, took a photo, sent it to him. And I'm like, bro, you know, I'll, I'll take you with me wherever I go. And then that's when I realized I'd accomplished my dream. My dream was to show myself that I could make it and I made it tick, but to also show my brother that he can do whatever he dreams. And the last gig, he was the only gig he didn't attend. And that's because he flew to London to chase his dream. So tick, it was done. And I never played again <laughs> in a professional setting at least. Wow. Dan, that's, that's an incredible story. Yeah, I, I, I have, I have so many uh so many thoughts after hearing that um I think, I think to begin with no i mean i just like you know it it's it's so i love i love you bringing you know tony robbins into this like what you know people either what is it they they run towards pleasure they run away from pain is that what you said yeah they either people either run towards pleasure or they they run away from pain and that's like when you're but when you're young though like that is the time to chase your dreams and i I think my first question, though, that I'm I'm curious about because I don't know I don't know the answer to this one. What makes a great DJ? <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> contrary to popular belief, people think that we just go up there and we just press buttons. You know what I mean? Well, we do that. We do press buttons. That's what we do. do. But to be honest, man, ninety percent of DJing to me is track selection and taste in music. And I feel that's where me and Chong really relate. I remember, bro, when we got, I got into the car with you, Chong's playing tunes and I'm like, one track, next track. I'm like, bro, is this my playlist, man? <laughs> like, if you, nobody's got these tunes, man. Like, surely you got my playlist. Little, little, little did we know that we have the exact same taste in music. Then I went to his house and he's putting on classical and I'm like, Ludovico Einaudi, this, that. I'm like, what? And because oh, we man. have beautiful tastes in music. And for me, it wasn't necessarily about just following a genre or following a trend. It's about following a theme. And the theme for me is, so again, energy. Like you go to a, a R and b party and it's all about shaking your body and dancing together in groups. You play house music and, you know, you're still dancing in a group and you're facing the DJ and you're partying, having a good time. But when you play trance music, 
Like you are taking people on a journey, sometimes outside of their body, sometimes outside of their mind. And they may not even dance. They might just close their eyes and just enjoy the moment. And it's really emotion. And so for me, you know, the art of a good DJ is to read the crowd, to understand energy, and then to choose the right track that is going to like enhance the moment. And to be honest, like when I DJ, my best sets are the ones where I just get up on the decks and I just like play. I don't even know what I'm playing. I just feel it. And then the next song comes into my head, the next song. And I'm just like, I'm just the vessel playing the tracks and I'll play for sometimes three, four, five hours. One time I played for 18 hours straight, but it was just a beautiful journey. And I feel like that's what I said. Sometimes you can get in your head and oh, what's the crowd want? What does the crowd want? And you lose that flow and then you play the wrong track and it's like, uh oh, and you disjoint the energy. And so it's all about, you know, understanding energy and I guess like, yeah, working with energy to create an experience for, for the whole group. And that's the beautiful thing about trans music. Everybody is facing the DJ. Everybody is like in their own world, but we're all facing a DJ and we're all going to the same destination. We're all on the same journey. And for me, that's the beautiful part about DJing. I'd be remiss if I didn't go back to that. You you once played for 18 straight hours. <laughs> yeah, so funnily enough, I quit DJing in 2013 professionally. Um, one of the reasons I quit DJing was because it was a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, a lot of toxicity. And um, I never thought I would play again because I was done with that life. And I, I did three years sobriety. And that's when I actually found Cacao and worked with Cacao. But then we started throwing cacao parties, things like that. And then one day we got invited to go to a festival. This was probably six years after I stopped DJing. We got invited to go to a festival to bring our cacao bar there. And instead of just setting up a stall and serving cacao, I'm like, let's, I'm always extreme. Like, let's set up a massive TP. Let's build a bar. Let's have staff, DJs, this, that. And then when I got there, this was the first time that I'd actually downloaded new music in six years. I downloaded 200 tracks and I'm like, I can't wait to play these tracks. Never played them before. I got there, I had seven DJs lined up to play. And then the owner of the festival, she's like, you can't have seven DJs. You can't get seven tickets. She's like, I'll give you one ticket. I was like, all right, cool. And so then I had to play 12 hours a day for four days. And on the last day on New Year's Eve, I played from 9 a.m to 3 a.m. in the morning and then RTP, we closed the festival and we had like thousands of people come and watch and it was amazing. Were you not tired? <laughs> no, man. What is that? <laughs> so this is the thing, man. I discovered I discovered my lost passion and we, we as the Cacao Bar, our intention to be there was to create a safe space like where people can come mm. and party without the need for drugs and alcohol. And um, it was funny. I didn't intend to play till three in the morning. I actually thought it was New Year's Eve. We're a tiny teepee, like off site, you know, in the, you know, in on the grass in the field somewhere. And I actually told my staff, I said, listen, we're going to play all day as long as we can, but don't be disheartened if at 11 o'clock everybody leaves and goes to the main stage because it's New Year's Eve. They're going to have the best night. But man, it was so beautiful because we played three nights before that. We made friends the first night, friends the second night, friends the third night. It really did die off at about 9.30 and I was getting ready to wind it down. But then those groups that we connected with came back, came back and people chose to spend New Year's with us in our teepee in, a sober, in the sober part of the festival. And it was really beautiful because, you know, as they kept coming and kept coming, kept coming, another stage would close, another stage would close. And then people would just gravitate. And before we knew it, every stage was closed. And we were the only ones open and we were just, I was just going for it. And my whole team was on board and we were like, whoa, what's happening here? And it was just wild. And it was crazy because I had people come up to me and they're like, man, I saw you DJing at 9 a.m. when I was getting my smoothie from here. And then I saw you when I was getting my lunch from across the way. And now like, the, I used to be playing for 18 hours. Like, what is this guy on? And it's like, cacao. <laughs> that's it, man. Just cacao. So that's the Damn. perfect that's that's the perfect transition so i i would love to hear about sacred taste yeah so to sacred taste basically is a cacao brand that um that kind of started organically you know pun intended but basically you know when i quit my dj career i quit at the height i just played for above and beyond high sense arena seven and a half thousand people i got to warm up for them above and beyond was my favorite act in the world 
a year later, I transitioned out, finished my last gig at Stereo Sonic. And then I said to myself, I don't want to do it. I don't want anything to do with DJing. I don't want anything to do with drugs, alcohol. I'm done with that scene. And basically I packed everything into a van and I had to change my environment to really thrive and to recreate myself. I had to change my environment. And so I packed everything into a van and I moved to Bondi. And then I did three years sobriety and used, used cacao as my substitute. So cacao is a great substitute for coffee, for alcohol, for other substances, because it actually, it's got, it's got, um, uh, basically it's got theobromine, it's got magnesium, which relaxes your nervous system, really rich in antioxidants, but it also releases oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins. So all the chemicals that make us feel good, make us feel happy, make us feel blissful and love. Cacao does that when you drink it in its raw form. And in its raw form, like it's actually chocolate, but in its raw form, it's not a confectionery item. It's actually a nutrient dense superfoods. And uh, the ancient Mayans used to use it as a bridge to connect to the spirit realm. So when you have it in its raw form and you have it like a wild crafted source in a proper way, it can really like open your heart and it'll give you a, a ton of energy, but also, you know, there's no come down. So it makes you feel happy. It makes you feel good. And basically that's what we were doing. We started creating a holistic high that you don't have to come down from. And it was maybe a year into my transition into Bondi that someone actually, one of my friends, I deleted my identity. I erased my DJ profile, everything. And it was about a year after being in Bondi that my friend actually comes up to me. He's like, bro, I just Googled you and you're a superstar DJ, man. What are you doing here in Bondi being an urban gardener? Like, what do you, what, what happened? And I told him what happened, how I achieved everything. And he was like, man, do you want to throw a party? I'm like, nah, bro, I'm done with parties. Don't want to DJ. And he's like, what if we throw a cacao party? And I'm like, all right, we'll see how it goes. I will I'll help you throw the party, but I don't want to DJ. And I helped him throw the party. And I remember he was on the decks. He was DJing. And he's like, come up here and DJ. Come up and I'm like, nah, nah, nah. He's like, come on, man. I got to go to the bathroom. Jump on the decks and play. And I'm like, all right, I jumped on the decks and he was gone for like 10 minutes. He didn't come back. 20 minutes didn't come back. 40 minutes later, man, he's in the crowd and he's like, yes, he's loving it. And I was just playing my old trance music that I had on a keychain. And then I played for like two, three hours. I got off the decks and he was like, man, how was that? Did you have fun? I'm like, yeah, bro, that was fun. He's like, all right, man, let's keep doing this. And that's basically how those cacao parties were born. And basically we were doing a cacao party every month on the full moon in Bondi. And we'd have, you know, anywhere between 100 to 200 people come at a time, everybody getting naturally high with the cacao and with the music. And I never thought that would be possible to get people to those same heightened state, states of consciousness without the substances. But we managed to do that. What a story. I'm going to take it back to something you were saying earlier. Um, after the first question, you mentioned time is ticking. You mentioned the word regret. Yeah. And I think this is such a powerful idea that I think most people can actually lean into and benefit from and, and take more action in the right yep. direction in their life. And if for the people listening, you know, can you, I guess, take them through that process of, um, you know, when they are at a cross point or at this, a point where they want to make, need to make a decision, like, do I take this risk or do I follow my heart? Do I follow my feeling? Do I try this or not? Um, or there is something maybe that, uh, including myself, I feel like, um, you know, I'm really would love to do, but um, maybe is lacking a little bit of urgency to actually um, create that reality right now. Yep. Like how, how would you use those two ideas of like, you know, time is ticking and potentially uh, regretting, you know, when you're on your deathbed kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Excellent. Excellent question, man. And so since I, I, I took myself through that process, I continuously take myself through that process. So for instance, like now we do cacao ceremonies as well as cacao parties. And two weeks ago, we did a new moon cacao ceremony and the theme was purpose. And so we, we drink cacao, everybody relaxes, they lie down. And then we take people on a guided journey. We play music 
again, you know, energy. We choose the right song. We take people on a journey. And then we, I, I actually take them through a guided journey. And for this one, this is what we did for this particular one. And basically the first journey, we took them into their childhood to go back to who they were when they were a child, before conditioning, before expectations, everything to really tap into, you know, who, why they are here, like what is their purpose and to tap into that, you know, that childlike purpose and that childlike call. Then the second journey was like back into the press, come back to the present moment. Right. And then let's go down, let's go come on a journey with me down to like 10 years into the future, 20 years, 30 years, all the way to the end of your life. If you do not make these changes now. And I literally would take people to the last, the last year, the last month, the last week, the last day, the last hour of your life. And then in the last 10 minutes, what would you think if you could think back on your life, if you didn't make these changes now, with looking back on your life, on your deathbed, what would you feel? What would you think? How would you feel? And then literally I get everybody in the room to actually take their last breath. Now let's take one last breath together and release. And then they actually die before they die. And then I bring them back to the present moment. All that's been erased. Now you back in the present moment, you have a choice to choose the other path where you choose with, to go for what you love and forget about your fears and smash through it. Take yourself 10 years into the future, 20, 30, to the last year, the last month, the last week, the last day, the last hour of your life. What are you thinking mm. now? You know, what are you thinking? And then think of all your life flashes before your eyes. What changes have you made? What how have you become as like as a character? What what new things have you experienced and enjoyed? How can you are you looking back on your life and just being like, whoa, I lived the full life? Now take your last breath and then and then we pull them out. And man, the, the, the journeys were amazing, man. People were like journaling for like 45 minutes. One person actually went to work the next day, quit her job, called her mom and said, mom, I'm coming back home. I'm starting my business. Like that action, man, like insane. And so obviously people don't have exposure to this often, but this is something that we do when we do our cacao ceremonies. And this is a process that people can do in their own meditation, but it's not as powerful without the music, without someone prompting you or guiding you or holding you. And also the cacao helps you again, open your heart, see the visions and tap into that. And so for anyone listening, like if you really want to take action, the best thing to do is like our body doesn't know what's a dream or what's a reality. So it's just to visualize yourself. If I don't take action now, how will I be in 10 years time, 20 years time? What will it cost me? And then go all the way to the end of your life and feel into that. And your body is going to react. It doesn't feel good. Bring yourself back to the start, run the process again. What if I make those changes? What if I overcome these challenges? What if I face my fears? And if I get to live the life that I really deserve now, 10 years, 20 years, 30. And man, once you see the, juxta, the juxtaposing visions and, and life, it's, it's almost impossible to not take action as it was for me. I took action straight within one, that day I did that first visualization on myself within one year, I went from being nobody to playing overseas within one year. That's how quickly you can turn it around. Dan, we've got to give up, give this um, experience to more people. Like, can we do it online? Like virtually? Absolutely, bro. So that's, that's the dream of mine for me, similar to you, Chong, I want to have maximum impact. So right now we were doing these ceremonies with 20 people max. So everybody can share as well. And we can all learn from each other's journeys, but that's, there's limitations to that. So we are going to start recording these and putting these online. Like I said, last month was all about purpose and that's in alignment with astrology, like what's happening with the stars and the moon. So we use that energy. Um, next month is all about action. The one before that was about direction. So you can imagine as a three, what is your direction? What is your life direction? How, how can you find your inner compass, right? And then they find their inner compass and they know how to tap into it. What's my direction versus the external world's direction? Found my direction. Next month is what is my purpose? And then the next month is action. And so, you know, people that come with us on these journeys for sometimes three months, six months, sometimes six months, uh, you know, even 12 months, man, they have incredible transformation, man. Some people even say like one session is worth more than 12 months worth of therapy. 
because it's completely immersive. We, we like this body, mind, spirit, it's music, sound, guidance, it's journaling, you know, it's every aspect of that person's being. And again, going into your inner child, what were you, what are you here to do? What is your purpose? Because I feel like, man, everybody, everything in nature serves a purpose and that purpose is to serve something else. The water doesn't drink itself. Air doesn't breathe itself. Everything in nature serves a purpose and that purpose is to serve something else. For me, humans, I believe, are the only things that don't serve a purpose on this planet. And if we were to leave the planet, the planet would probably thrive, which means that we are the fruits of this planet. You know, we are the fruits of this organism. And so this is our playground. And I feel that everybody has a unique gift or multiple unique gifts. And I feel like the purpose of our life is to discover those gifts. And then the purpose is to actually give those gifts away. And so, yeah, we're here to help people discover who they are, why they're here, what their gifts are, and then how they can implement that into the world. Mm. Super meaningful, man. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome, brother. My pleasure. Mm. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, if everybody just did what they loved, then the world will know peace. If everyone was here doing what they love, man, they would be living a very fulfilled life, purposeful life. And then I think the world will know peace. And so for me, that's one of my missions, especially through sacred, which is a vessel. Sacred is a vehicle. When you have cacao, it really does tap you into your heart to discover your purpose. And when you work with cacao, you become more in alignment and live from the heart. And when we live from the heart, yeah, we can live a purposeful life. And I think that's one of the most important things that we're doing with sacred. Mm. In a world where there's so many pressures, financial pressures, there's distractions on social media, there's addictions, you know, living from the heart, um, doing what we love to a lot of people seems like a foreign, such a foreign thing. And maybe it doesn't seem that possible. You know, we've got to pay the bills. And yep. everyone needs to pay the bills. Uh, how do you manage that? All of that? Yeah. <laughs> well, for me personally, like, again, so I actually have a couple of businesses. So one is obviously sacred. Another one is like-minded, right? Now, that's just something I do on the side. It's not a business I push. But inside like-minded is a formula and a system that can that really does help people break free from the nine to five and actually go do what they love. The read that what you just said there is spot on, man. People are bogged. They have a dream, they have a vision, but they're too afraid to actually take that step because they got to pay the bills, this and that. Again, pain, pleasure. They have something they really dream of that they really want, but there's a little bit of pain. I don't know how to start a business. I don't know how to do the nine to five. I have a system that breaks down those barriers and like pushes them through. And I've probably taken maybe a dozen or more people through it. Most of them, my friends and man, I'm so blessed because every single person in my friendship circle has broken three, free of the nine to five. And they've actually, they've stepped into doing what they love. And now they're actually, they've provided not only an income for themselves, but also for their families. One, one person has created an income for her mother. She's hired a mother you know, and they're doing things like that where they're helping their family and the things that I've taught them, they've actually applied it and they've gone and done it. And that's like, for me, one of my proudest achievements is not only to see myself do it and myself break three from the nine to five, but to see other people taking that chance and doing it themselves. And when you are surrounded by a community that no longer think in that fear paradigm of paying bills, this and that, but they start, they start living in the love paradigm and they start manifesting things, as soon as they cut that tie with that fear paradigm and they take that step onto that path with love, the universe just starts providing in abundance. And um, it's been beautiful to watch people people do that. Even myself, like meeting you, you know what I mean? Like that was just like, came to daybreak. I drove 12 hours to get there, was there for like six hours. And everyone else is like, dude, you're crazy. Why are you driving 12, like 12 hours there, 12 hours back for six hours? I'm like, I don't know. My heart is telling me I need to be there. My mind is like, that makes no financial sense. That makes zero logic. But my heart is saying go. And I'm like, I don't question my heart anymore. I'm like, let's go. Went there. You were the last customer. Met you there. And now we've become friends. And now you've helped me enable my path and like put me on my journey. And now we're on this journey together. So 
I always do my best to listen to my heart. And I would, my only advice to, to people who are, have that passion and have that, you know, that hope or that dream is to really like drop out of the head and into the heart. And one of the way to do that is to, yeah, remove those barriers and we can do that for, um, for them, but also they can do that for themselves by taking themselves again through that meditative journey and, and finding that fuel because yeah, if you move away from pain, then just put your regret of not doing it there and it'll be like a rocket ship into uh, through your barriers and into the place that you love the most. So that would be my mm. advice on that. Powerful, man. The heart knows, the mind thinks. Absolutely. Right. And the thing, the, the heart for me is like a compass and the mind is like the GPS. So it's like the heart says, I want to go in this direction. But the mind is like, all right, what about this obstacle? What about this obstacle? And the heart, the mind might try and convince the heart not to go there because, oh, this is a ravine. This is a cliff. Like, but then the heart's like, no, we've got to go find the way, you know? And I think when you start putting them both together and using them as tools, man, you can travel great distances and have a great journey and enjoy the process. Enjoy every step of the way. That's the most important thing. Mm. Man, Dan, you I have so much to offer. I know. Um, Dan, I'm, oh, sorry. Go, go on, Chang. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I'd love for you to do a facilitator session for the Momi team. Yeah. It'd be so oh, good. man. I would love to, man. I would love to. I actually just facilitated my first session, right? You know, you know my mate Carlo. I think I linked you with him, right? He yep. called me up. He's like, bro, I'm doing an event in Melbourne. I'm not feeling the best. There's a lot going on in my life. Can you jump in and take over? I'm like, sure. I jumped in. He's like, what are you going to talk about? Like, I have no idea. Walked in there, I said, all right, everyone, raise your hands. Who's here if you're living a happy life? No one put their hand up. They were not happy with their life. And I'm like, cool, why aren't you living a happy life? And then, man, we just started to ask questions. We unpacked it and we came up with so many solutions, bro. We think we spoke for like three hours. It was amazing, bro. So I'm 100% keen to, to, I will say yes to any opportunity to work with people and bring out more of this gift that's what's inside me mm -hmm. to give. Because I feel like, Yes, DJing is a unique gift of mine, 100%. I'm a very good DJ and I love DJing. I also love business as well and, you know, in creating impactful businesses and helping people. But I do feel that this is my third gift. And, yeah, I would love the opportunity to share it with anyone I can, man. Thank you, man. Sorry, Ian, I've been hogging the questions. No, dude, you're <laughs> fine, man. I'm just, honestly, it's such a pleasure. I'm just sitting here, like, I'm listening. I'm just really processing. Dan, I really appreciate you know, your perspective and what you're saying. Um, something you said earlier that I just want to ask you about was that you said that, you know, we are humans are like the fruits of this earth. Um, and you said that we're supposed to kind of, it's our playground. And so I'm just curious, you know, how is this manifesting in your life right now? Like, how are you using earth as your playground? So um, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm actually inside a bus. I live out of a bus. <laughs> I noticed that when uh, we were talking before the, the recording. I was like, yeah, man. <laughs> so I don't have a fixed address. So I, I'm not like rooted down to one place. I am completely free. And I go literally wherever the wind takes me or wherever my heart pulls me to. And my days are filled with so much magic because I wake up every day and I'm like, cool, where do I want to work today? Which cafe, which area? And I feel into my heart and my heart's like, go here and I'll go there and I'll go there and I'll have a chat. And then all of a sudden, I'll, someone would overhear a conversation. Like the other day, someone overheard a conversation with me on like a Zoom meeting. He come up and he's like, bro, I just want to introduce myself to you, man. Like, bang, I just made a new friend. And then he has opportunity for me and just other magic. One brother came to a ceremony. He actually came to the last ceremony and he's like, man, this is everything I was looking for. I'm so grateful I bumped into you. And so for me, this earth is our playground. And if we set limitations on how we play, we're not free. And so for me, I'm, I, I've, since a young age, man, I've always questioned everything. I've always questioned the status quo, the system, everything, how we live life. And I'm just like uncovering all that conditioning and I'm choosing to live life on my terms, provided it does not cause any harm to anybody then if it's not causing any harm and it makes me feel good, or if it's even adding value to other people, then this is my playground. So often we would do like cacao parties and we just throw random parties in the forest, in nature, you know, a fire, cacao bar, etc., under the full moon. And man, 
like there's no there's like laws that prevent me from doing this but it's like hey this is what i feel like doing and then actual rangers would come and be like this is amazing this is so good like this is what we need i'm like yeah think outside the box we can create whatever we want with our thoughts thoughts words actions and behaviors so you know what is your dream how can you call it into action and then how how can you actually yeah create that for yourself and allow others to do the same and enjoy it with you it's like a scene from a movie <laughs> like the, the, the park the park rangers being like uh sir you're uh you need a permit to be- what's going on here <laughs> what is that Man. is that hot chocolate <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing they would come in they would come in all staunch man and be like what's going on here and then they're like what are you serving like you can't have alcohol in this it's like there's no alcohol they're like what are you serving it's cacao they're like what's cacao i'm like chocolate and then they would try i'll give it to them they're like no 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 no. i'm like guys it's just chocolate and then they have it the cacao starts working on them and then they start to have a little bit of a boogie as well man you know and they start to have fun and they're like wow like this is what we need especially coming out of the pandemic they're like we need this connection we need this connection to land we need this connection to each other we need to like this is who we used to be we used to be in like you know years and years and years ago we used to be in tribal culture where we would connect like this and we would gather and we don't do that anymore and so for me it's important to create these spaces where people can come together and also to to to, to connect to celebrate but to also express themselves you know, it gives people a chance to break three, free of the norm and free of the paradigm that restrains them and think of, well, why am I here? What am I here to do? And how can I find out my, find my gifts and how can I give them away? And so many people have, have done that, you know, due to some of the work that we do. And um, yeah, I'm really blessed to be, you know, a facilitator of those experiences. Mm. Tell us a little bit about um, the, the sacred business. Uh, I know you're spending most of your time right now working on sacred. Yes. I mean, pretty much like 24 hours of my time a day is spent building this business. Um, And so basically, yeah. So, um, you know, being authentic and um, I mean, having a name like sacred, choosing a name like sacred as our business uh, name it comes with a standard. It's a pretty high standard to call something sacred. And so, you know, Chong, gratitude to you. You enabled me to go into the jungle and collect the cacao. We weren't here to just start a cacao business for the sake of it. We started a cacao business before cacao became popular. Now cacao is like one of the fastest growing trends in the market. It's massive. So many cacao ceremonies and parties and other facilitators are using it, but we want it to be really authentic. And so, you know, we have four flavors of cacao. We have original, chili, rose, matcha, mint. They all align with an element, earth, fire, water, and air. And then we have 100% pure ceremonial grade cacao, which is what we call ceremony. And that's the spirit element. That's what we use for special occasions in ceremonies. But for me, it was super important that the whole story from start to finish or from seed to serve was like immaculate. And so in 2019, I actually flew from Melbourne to Peru and I actually went into the jungle to go source our cacao. And it was like a 16-hour bus ride, two-hour car ride, seven-hour canoe ride down the Amazon. And there, there's over 300 families that grow and cultivate our cacao in the wild under the forest canopy. And the cacao that they grow is called the Criollo cacao. It's the original cacao strain. That's where the cacao first originated. And there's only 6% of it left in the market. It's actually like, you know, it's kind of like going extinct because other cacao strains can you know they can they slash the rainforest and then they grow the cacao especially most of our cacao which is grown in africa is done that in that in that form but what the ashaninka are doing the 300 families they're actually preserving the land protecting the culture protecting their way of life and they're actually that number is now getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so you know they use the money that we give them to preserve their land protect their culture protect their way of life and then we bring it over here we mix it into the four flavors, um, we, you know, which has a different impact on the body and there's something for everybody. And then we have the 100% pure ceremonial gray cacao. But what differentiates us from, you know, some other brands um, is that we have something for everybody. Most brands are either 100% pure ceremonial, so very spiritual, or it's like a sugar laden hot chocolate. And for me, it makes no sense to mix mother nature's most nutrient dense superfood with sugar. 
most other brands is like 50, 60, 70% sugar. We found a way to actually sweeten it using superfood. So we use carob, lacuma, and a little bit of coconut blossom nectar. And the beautiful thing is, like I said before, cacao is considered food of the gods. The actual name, Theobroma cacao, like Theo and Broma, literally translates to food of the gods. And that's grown in the valley. And then lacuma is considered gold of the Incas, and it's grown in the mountains. And when we put those two together, we have a very beautiful, sacred blend that tastes delicious and is like super good for you. And so we're very humbled and very blessed to be able to share this medicine with the world. I'm not sure if many people would go into the jungle and collect it like I collected it. In fact, to go into the jungle, I had to get two translators, one that's someone that spoke English to Spanish and someone that spoke Spanish to Ashaninka. And in the process of getting these, getting these translators, people were saying to me, you can't go into that jungle. I'm like, why not? They're like, you're going to die. One lady saying, tell the police. The next lady saying, don't tell the police. But again, my heart, wanted like knew it was there where it wanted to go and basically there was a lot of fear that came up a lot of fear but i worked through it and i trusted my heart and then i jumped on that boat went into the jungle collected the cacao came back out and i feel like we have one of the best cacao um brands in the world wow <laughs> the journeys you go through mate just <laughs> Man, this is just the tip of the iceberg, man. If I tell you the whole story of that journey, oh my gosh, man, I went through a full on pilgrimage, man. Like it was crazy, crazy wild. I didn't know if I was going to die, if I was going to live. Like even my mom, when she kissed me goodbye, when I left Melbourne, she's like, son, if I never see you again, <laughs> if I never see you again, just know that I love you and you are loved. And, you know, I support you going on this journey. I'm like, thanks, mom. Literally, no one thought I was coming back, man. They didn't think I was coming back for two reasons. But one, that I might get kidnapped and I might die. Two, I might get over there and love it so much because they know my wild <laughs> essence that I'm just going to be like, I'm not coming back. I'm living here now. See you guys. So either way, she thought, either way, if you don't come back, like, just know that I love you and I'm always here. Yeah. Dan, I'm, I'm I'm curious about this man, like this uh, this outgoing, this adventurous spirit that you have. Uh, your you know your your energy is so uh, wonderfully contagious. You know, um, is this something that you feel like? Is this a muscle that you have to keep working? Because it doesn't sound like it was present in your life before that Tony Robbins seminar. Like, do you feel like this is something that, that you feel like you have to keep working and maybe and like that you're slightly maybe concerned that you might take a step back and, and, and you know, do you ever feel uh, that there's a, a threat of that happening? Um, how long do I have to answer this question? <laughs> you have <laughs> as long as, as you want. <laughs> Sweet. So be beautiful question and beautiful observation. For me, it's not really a muscle that I pull. It's just me taking all the other shit off. You know what I mean? Mm. So from a young age, I always used to see the world like this. I never used to understand the world. I used to be like, mom, why do we need to like pay to live on this planet? Or, you know, why are we here? Like what happens when we die? Why are we living like this? Like all these crazy questions to the point where I would, I would speak like this. And then my brother would actually, he pulled me aside one day and he's like, bro, like careful speaking like that. People are going to think you're crazy right? <laughs> They're going to think you're crazy. And I'm like, I remember I was, I was with some of his mates. They're like five years older than me. And one of my mates, he was like telling his story. He's like, man, I can't wait in two years time. I'm going to have enough money. I'm going to buy this car. I'm going to do this and do that. And then I'm going to be happy. And then here I am five years younger. I'm like, man, are you serious? I was 16 at the time. They were like 20. I'm like, man, are you serious? I'm like, you mean to tell me you want to work two years, five days a week to then buy things to then be happy? Like you can be happy right now. You know what I mean? And I'm like, does success equal happiness or does happiness equal success? How are you framing it? So for me as a young age, man, I always, I was originally like the way I am now, but I was then conditioned that I would, again, why was I worried I wasn't going to get accepted when I was DJing? Cause it came from my childhood. Don't speak like that because you know, people are going to think you're crazy. AKA people are going to not accept you. 
And so basically I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, I don't fit into this world. So let me just assimilate. What can I do that I love? That is what everyone else will approve on. I'll become a DJ. Did that, achieved that, got to the top of the mountain. And I was like, you know what? There's no fulfillment there for me. I'm done with that. Came back down, lost everything, lost my house, lost my income, lost my job, erased my identity. And then I basically moved into a van into Bondi and literally started from scratch. And from that point, I recreated myself in my original vision of who I was and who I wanted to be and how I wanted to show up in this world. And that's the thing, man. I used to be young and have conversations with God. I'm like, God, why would you put me in this day and time? Why couldn't you have birthed me 500 years ago and live wild and free? I don't fit in here. And it was only until recently that I realized, wow, he put me here for a reason. I'm, I'm placed here for a reason and I don't fit in. And that's because if you don't fit in into the current world, you're here to change it. And so now that I know my purpose, I am like full tilt, full steam. You can't stop me. The only thing, it's not a muscle I have to pump. It's just all I have to do is protect this energy from the outside forces that say I should be living differently, that say I should be living in a house or I should be living my life according to their terms. No, I'm going to live my life according to my terms. And if this doesn't align with you, if this doesn't resonate, that's totally fine. If this resonates with you and makes you question your life and makes you want to change, come with me on this journey and we'll go, we'll go there together. So for me, it's uh, this stuff is just like, I get so much energy from doing this. Like, this is what is like, I could, I could live off this. And that's how I feel. When you live a purposeful life, every day you just wake up and it's like you're on purpose. It's a testament to the, the purity of this, like truly giving um, full authority to the this inner child, right? That gets tainted as we grow up. It's like, but there's a protection. There's like, you have something beautiful that you, and I think it's a testament to both how, how pure and, and beautiful that intention that you live your life with is, but it's also a testament to how, you know, the, the, the illness of, of society, you know, and like, and, and to say society is a generalized term. I'm not trying to say everything in society is evil, but essentially Correct. like the forces, the peer pressure, the assimilation, the, you know, we've, you've brought up alcohol a few times, like alcohol is a, it's in, it's insane to me. Like I, I, I don't, I, I'm not a big drinker. I wouldn't call myself sober, but I just, I just don't like alcohol. I don't like what it does <laughs> to people. I don't like what I, I've seen people do on it. Um, I have a, a, a huge aversion to, to that. And so, but you look at these things and there are these very natural things in society that we're taught are totally normal. In fact, not just normal, but it's, 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 it should be a part of your life. It should be a part of your ritual. You know what I mean? And like, when you mention that you have to protect this, this part of yourself from that, from this world, I think that that mentality resonates with, with not just me, but so many people out there where it's like, it's like that's sort of just, there's sort of this um, malicious, you know, intention of society you know social media to distract you to you know to take something from you without giving anything back and um you know that's really what i took from from what you were saying uh it's just that is precious when you find that state it's like you don't want to you don't want to let somebody hurt it so i i just 100%. I, I really, I'd really admire that man. And I, I'm just curious about going back to the DJ, um, the moment that you, that you stopped, was that, was that premeditated? Did you think to nah. yourself, when I get to this place, I'm, I'm out after this. Like once I get my dream, I'm done. I'm going to move <laughs> on to the next thing. So interesting, interesting story, right? So, um, so I didn't become, I didn't break through as like the main DJ or the top DJ of Australia. I was always just up and coming. And so it was always my dream to warm up for above and beyond. And basically every, I had like 10 goals and I basically achieved each goal, like in succession, 10, 9, 8, da, 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 and to one. And then I achieved it. And when I got to warm up for above and beyond, it was so beautiful, like sold out show, high sense arena, seven and a half thousand people. And I'm warming up for my idols. It was amazing. Played the best set got off the decks, met above and beyond. I was like, what? And then I got into the stands and I had like maybe 50 or hundred friends with me. Most of them wearing a t-shirt with my name on it. And 
I remember Above and Beyond was playing my favorite song. It's called On a Good Day. And it says like, it's like about having a good day. It feels like me on a good day. And then they were playing my favorite song. I got my camera out. I was recording it. And then they have the ability to write on their laptop and it goes up on the big screen. They said, it's moments like these that make the difference in life. It feels like me on a good day. We'd like to thank our warm-up DJ, D-A-N. And then as they were typing my name, my whole friendship circle was just like, what? Stacks on. And like, oh my gosh, we did it. And they didn't say you did it. They were like, we did it. Because it was a collective journey, you know? We did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. And man, I, crying, you know? Beautiful moment. And then like I went, I went home and then I was driving back the next day and I was thinking about my journey and I was like really like sad, like, but like just like overwhelmed with emotion. I was like, wow, like I thought of every single person that helped me on that journey, you know, everyone helped me get there and we got there and we did it. And I basically got home and I wrote a message to everybody, guys, thank you so much for being a part of that journey. You were all there in little snippets, but you all came together for this one moment in time, which is my highlight of my career. We all celebrated, but I said, this is the top of the mountain for me. There is no other high I can chase that's better than this in this arena. Who else can I play for that's better than my idol? Nobody. And I had no intention of being the main DJ. I love to warm up. I love to play underground sounds and warm up. And so I actually achieved that. And then I remember like, you know, for me, I, I was thinking about, I'm like, why did I stop? And then I realized that the height of our limitation is in direct proportion to the depth of your desire. And I didn't desire to go any further. And so I hit my limitation. And it's funny because when I found my poster, when I went to Tony Robbins, my goal wasn't to be the, the biggest DJ, trans DJ, da, da, da. My goal was specifically this, to become Australia's biggest up and coming trans dj and that's exactly what i did <laughs> that's exactly what that's exactly what i did and then the funny thing was i so I, I i was at the top of the mountain i realized that i achieved my dream i let everybody know that's the top i'm gonna come back down now and i'm gonna transition and it was took me a year to transition after that i played with w and w cosmic gate 2000 people like you know i was still growing but then it was Stereosonic 2013 that I actually quit. It was the first two-day event. And I actually thought people would go easy the first day, hard the second day. No, people went hard the first day, even harder the second day on drugs, right? So they were really cooking themselves, you know what I mean? And even myself, I was like really like, you know, quite quite drained. And then I, I remember I finished my set. I, warm, I opened up the trance arena. I was playing Deep House in the trance arena. I was that tired. But I finished my set and then I went into the crowd and I was so tired that I just sat and I observed everyone. All my friends came and sat with me and we would stand in, in the stands. We observed everybody. And I didn't like what I saw, man. I saw people punching on, people ODing, people like, you know, just completely destroying their bodies, completely destroying the planet. And I thought to myself, what is all this for? Who's benefiting from this? There's only a bunch of few people who are making a lot of money off the misfortune of, of these kids and of the, to the detriment of the planet. I'm like, man, I don't want to be an advocate for this anymore. And then that night I was meant to be warming up for another international DJ at the after party. And I was meant to do a back-to-back -back set. And my boss messaged me. He's like, bro, you got to do the set by yourself. I'm like, why? He's like, the other guy can't make it. He's too cooked. And I'm like, man, I can barely make it. And that's, he's like, nah, man, you got to do it. You got to play two hours. And I'm like, oh man. And then I hung up the phone and I'm like, you know what? I'm done with this. And then I put out a message to everyone and said, guys, if you want to come and see me again, play again, come tonight. It's the last gig I'll ever do. And it was. It, you know, it, it sounds it sounds very similar to this experience that um, I was reading about uh, when I think it was when the Beatles went to. Uh, do you know this story? It's like the Beatles were they they had been hearing about LSD and they've been hearing about all this magic and this like kind of festival. And so they I forget the name of it. I don't want to embarrass myself by you know mispronouncing it or you know but i think that there was a moment when george harrison was looking out in the crowd and he he thought everyone was so spiritual he thought that there was something really special happening here and then he realized everybody was just really high yep. um and i think that what i'm hearing you it's it that the story you described sounded like that it's like that that big question is like what 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 problem is this solving just you know it's like with yes, yeah, with yeah. drugs it's like and i even think sometimes 
I think to myself, I'm like, where does, do people like, where, where does this desire even come from? You know what I mean? To like, what is that thing that everybody, what is that, that euphoria that people are chasing? Like, what is that thing? And, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, like, it sounds like that was a very meaningful moment for you, but do you recall feeling sad? Do you recall feeling angry? Did you feel like you were, you know, un unknowingly, uh, you know, just like someone um, perpetuating this, this like negativity? Yeah, absolutely. And and to answer, there's a few points in that in that statement, you know, that I'd like to address. And you know, the first one would be like, why do we come to these spaces to do these things, right? And for me. I feel like it's, we come there to connect, right? I feel like there's so much disharmony in the world. And I feel like that's due to a lack of connection. When we're not connected to our bodies, we pollute it. When we're not connected to the planet, we destroy it. And I feel like we come to these parties and come to these places to connect because we all crave connection. But when we come to these parties sober, we have, we're, we're so insecure at times about who we are that we have all these walls up that prevent us from connecting that we choose to have a substance to bring down those walls and then we can connect with confidence. The problem is those walls also reduce your inhibitions, makes you sloppy, and it's not a really good time. And that's the thing, what I love about cacao, cacao doesn't remove your barriers, it actually raises your vibration over the barriers so you can connect at a higher level. Now the only is other issue is, is when you're having these, these substances, yeah, you're, you're not really present you're creating these connections, but you don't know who these people are. You're not remembering the conversation, remember their name. And I remember I, every time I used to party and I used to go out and we'd have a lot of fun. Like we'd have unlimited drinks, we'd have unlimited, whatever we want. It was like a smorgasbord, you know? So it was a lot of fun. And I was very present in that moment, you know, cause it would take me out of my mind thinking about the future or worrying about the past and I would be present. So it's the only few times in my childhood that I would really be present is when I was on these substances. And I would enjoy myself in the moment until every single night, I remember it'd be about three o'clock in the morning when I'm still in the club or partying, it would be like every time, three o'clock, my conscious mind would come back in and be like, what is the purpose of all of this? <laughs> you know, you're going to regret this tomorrow. This is going to hurt, you know, like, why are you doing this? And then it's like, and then it's like, you're just borrowing happiness from tomorrow. And I'd be like, damn, damn, damn. And then like, literally I would, cause I'd be out for like, got like crashing for like a few days after. I wouldn't come back until Wednesday. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be back to my center. And I think that's the issue. Like we take these substances to remove our barriers. We borrow happiness from tomorrow and then we got to pay it back later. And I feel like it's all for this depth of desire that we really want to like, connect properly, but it's not real. So we keep coming back and chasing it. But in these cacao ceremonies that we do, cacao parties, there's no drugs, there's no alcohol. It's just cacao and conversation and music and the connections that people create. Chong, remember that first one we did here in Melbourne that you came and DJed for? Man, when I got off the decks, three people stopped me and they said three things. Man, I had the best time. I had the best conversations and I feel so good. Like you don't get that man at, a, at an alcohol party, you know what I mean? And the thing is the next day they felt better than, when, than, than the day before. And that's our ethos. Leave the place better than you found it. Leave feeling better than when you came in. That's our ethos. And that's what we achieve with this. So that's one part of that question. And I think that, you know, for the future, I think that people are actually starting to catch on to this. You know, alcohol is actually not only culturally accepted, it's culturally celebrated. How many drinks did you have? I had 10, I had 11 and this and that. It's celebrated, but it's not, it's not good for your body, not good for your brain, not good for the planet. And so what I love about cacao is like, yeah, you can still achieve all the positives that you're there to achieve, the connection, the community, the good time, the celebration, but there's no cost. There's no come down. You know, you actually feel better by drinking it than you did the day before. And I feel like that's really important. Literally going to make, go, go make myself a cup of cacao right after this. <laughs> Dude, My I'm, mouth is salivating when it, talking about this. I'm thinking the same thing. I'm like, I've never, I've never had this stuff. I gotta, I gotta, I'm going to run to Whole Foods after this right now and go get some. <laughs> like, actually, I'm going to go get some sacred. We'll get some sacred taste. Let, let us send you some. Man, for sure. We'll get I, it out there. Man. 
I would, I'm like listening to this. I'm like, I need this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were talking about that muscle, you know what I mean? Like flexing that muscle and working that muscle. Cacao will gen- naturally help you do that, brother. It'll naturally I, I, tap you into your heart and make better decisions based on your life's purpose. I heard a quote the other day, man, that was like, I, I forget who, t- who said this to me, but it really stuck. He said, pick the wildest dream you can think of. Just fucking go for it. <laughs> and, and, you know, I relate to that, man, because I, like I feel like throughout my life I've lived with that. I feel like I've lived with that sense of going for my dreams. You know, I feel like whether it was when I was, you know, 11, 12, and I remember I was in my, I was in my, my childhood bedroom and my mom came in to, like, say goodnight to me, and I, and I was crying. And she's like, what's wrong? And I said, Mom, do you, do you think I can be a, an actor? And she's like, actually, the specific thing I said was, do you think I can get an agent? And and she was like, yeah, I think you can get an agent. And I was living in North Carolina. We we didn't know anybody really in the industry. You know, my dad was a doctor. Um, my siblings, like, played high school sports. Like, you know, being a professional actor was so wild. And, you know, I got an agent a few years later and, you know, did my first film about a year after that. And And I worked really steadily in the industry for about 14 years. And you know, it's everything's still going. And it's like, I feel like when you, I feel like that's always been something I prided myself on is like picking the wildest dream and then going for it. You know, so I really, I really connect to that. Like the world is your playground. And, you know, obviously there's different factors that, that boil into this. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, like that's the approach that I have is like, I kind of like, even I thought about this today, I was so tired. I had to wake up really early. And I'm sitting there and I think it's like, it's, it's like 1130 and I've been up for, you know, I've been up for a while at this point and I'm just like, you have the rest of the day to make something happen. And I was like, whatever you want to do with this. And I had something at five. So I was like, whatever you want to do this next five and a half hours, it's whatever you want to do. None of it's bad. None of it's good. It's like, but this is your time that you have right now. And I heard John Mayer say something um, the other day. It was a clip on Instagram from his tour he's doing right now. Um, and he said something he's realized recently is that he he never wishes for less time. He never wishes for things to be over. He never wishes for, you know, for the moment to go away. Mm. And I think that I, I really appreciated that because it's it's true. It's like the moment will go away. You know, and like you were saying in your ceremonies, when you lead people through this, you know, um, for lack of a better word, ego death, when you're yep. bringing them on this journey and you're you're getting them used to that feeling, it's like the reality is that that day will come as as, you know, unsurprising and as horrifying as it is. And the question is, is like, what did you do from now till then? Absolutely. And that's all that matters, man. You know, that's, that's all that matters. That's it. And I think there's a beautiful quote. I'm probably going to butcher it, but it's like, don't ask, don't ask life for more time. Ask time for more life. Hmm. How can you bring more life, more of your life into your time and just make the most of this moment that we have as this moment is all we have. Bring more life into this time. Well said, man. And this is what the purpose of this podcast is really for, is to create more meaning in people's lives and to find the meaning, to, to learn about meaning and to share it with everyone. Um, and there's a question that we'd like to ask all our guests. Um, you can answer it however you like, however long or short you like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the question is, Dan, what is your meaning? What is my meaning Yeah. in terms of this life? Just in terms of you, your life, everything. For me, the meaning for me, the meaning for me is to explore, to discover, to uncover, to find out who we are, why we're here, what we can do with it, and to really play with the universe. Like we can, we can create, we can ask the universe for whatever we want, and if we really believe in it and are true to our, our, our nature, you know, the universe can play back. 
And for me, it's just about, yeah, exploring the boundaries and pushing them and finding out, you know, what, what we're here to do. How can, we, how can we bring more joy into our life and share that with others, you know? And whether it's, you know, if you like to play music, play music. If you like to play sports, play sports. Like whatever it is you like to do that brings you joy and makes your heart sing, do that and then show others to do the same and share that with others. Because like I said before, I fully believe that when we all can do what we love and we are all doing what we love, then the world will know peace. And that's all I want people to do is to do that. And I'm still discovering what that is for me. It's not like I haven't knowing, yeah, it's exactly what I want to do. I'm still discovering it and it changes with each phase of my life. And so, yeah, the, the meaning for me is to explore that, uncover that, enjoy that, enjoy the process and have a good time. Wow. Well said, my friend. <laughs> yeah, Dan, this has been such a pleasure, man. It's uh, really, really refreshing and, and, and truly um, inspiring your journey and, and everything you had to offer, you know, me and Chong on this conversation and our listeners. So really thank you for your time. Thank you for having us, guys. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, it was such a pleasure, such a pleasure to, to speak with you guys and loving this work that you guys are doing. And um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, pleasure is definitely ours, man. <laughs> and for, for everyone that's made it to the end of this podcast, really appreciate time. And hopefully we've uh, taken you one step closer to living um, your meaningful life. And um, hope to catch you on the next episode. Beautiful. Thanks, guys.